Hello, my name is Bill Lancaster and welcome again to the Teaching of the Word. I appreciate you joining me in the hope of the faith that lives within us, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, who has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the eternal kingdom of his being. May the fire of God cleanse you and purify you to all godliness and righteousness by doing away with the filthiness of the flesh, which is our carnal knowledge and belief that we created ourselves, and that our own doings are what justify us before God. Knowing this, that Christ Jesus' work in us will create in us a new life, a new way of living, which God himself ordained from the foundation of the world. Today, I want to start off by talking about the fire of God in detail and what the fire of God's purpose is. We know that Jesus said, I've come to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, in the past, it has been taught in traditional religion that the fire of God was going to destroy men because they did not live up to the word of God or the truths or the testimonies that are written in the book of the law. The truth of the matter is the fire of God is a destroying power, but it is only meant to destroy the wickedness of man the same way that a purification fire purifies gold doesn't harm the pure part of the gold but makes the dross come up out of the gold. It's the same with us. The purifying fire of God, like salt, which is also a symbol of God's purity and purification process, goes inside of us and separates out anything that can be burned up and leaves anything in us that can't be destroyed by fire. So when God said that he would destroy the world by fire this time, the same way he did when he destroyed it with water, he isn't talking about our world as the outer world, but he's talking about the world within us. The fiery trials that were to come upon us is the fire of the Spirit executing the one in us who does not obey God. You see, the carnal mind and the enmity of flesh and blood is God's enemy. That's why it says the carnal nature cannot please God. In Romans chapter 8, it says that the enemy of God is man's carnality and way of thinking. Man and his pride and exultation deeming himself worthy to bring righteousness to himself towards God, overlooked God's righteousness, which is Christ being revealed by God in us, creating faith and bringing forth a new nature through the purifying fire of God, which destroys one kingdom and raises up another. I'd like, if you would, to turn with me to Mark chapter 9 and we're going to start at verse 47. If your eye causes you to stumble, this is Jesus talking, if your eye causes you to stumble in sin, pluck it out. It is more profitable and wholesome for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and their fire is not put out. For everyone, all, any, every, the whole, shall be salted with fire. Salt is good. The purifying power of God is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you restore the saltiness to it? Have salt within yourselves 
and be at peace in harmony with one another. You know that last week, if you were watching, we discussed that God, when speaking of eyes, is not talking about these eyes, but in fact talking about the two eyes within us. The picture that he uses is to use these eyes to describe the true eyes that are in us, which is the I am, which is Christ in me, and I, me, mine, which is my own nature and the nature of flesh and blood that I have. And I've told you that the inner man, the Christ, will overcome the outer man, which is man and his nature and likeness and being. So the I that causes us to stumble in sin that must be plucked out is not a physical I, but in actuality, the I of my own selfishness. I'll do this, I'll do that. That nature in me will be plucked out and the nature of the I am will be left inside of me. It is more profitable and wholesome for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown in hell. The way that one eye will be plucked out of me and one will be left is by the purifying fire of God burning out of me the unrighteous eye and leaving the righteous eye within me. That's why it says it's more profitable for me to have one eye than to have two and have to go through the fire. God's fire was designed for the devil and his angels, which represents flesh and every side and every human being that thinks selfish and evil thoughts. For everyone will be salted with fire. Folks, everyone is going to taste of God's fire. The Bible says that all liars will be thrown into the lake of fire. It's written in Revelations. Then in another place it says that all men are liars. You see, God isn't going to destroy men. He's going to destroy the part in men that lies. He's going to destroy the part in men that thinks murderous thoughts. He's going to destroy the part in men that thinks adulterous thoughts. He's going to destroy wickedness out of man and not man himself. You don't wash the baby down with the bath water. You get rid of the bath water and wipe the baby off with the towel and dry him off. You don't destroy your children, you discipline them. So the tradition that has been taught us that God was going to destroy men is actually just a tradition. He is only going to destroy the part that does evil and that carries out carnality, which is God's enemy. So as I've told you before, we have no outward enemies. The part that I don't like in my brother is the same carnality that I have in my own self. Now, we just read where it said the worm doesn't die and the fire shall not be put out. There's been a teaching that the fire that's not going to be put out is a fire that is going to burn up wicked men who don't choose to know and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But in actuality, Gehenna, or the place of the fire, that won't be put out is a place inside of us that God has set on fire, the fire of hell, our carnal nature being dissolved by this fire. The fire will not be put out the same way that you let a campfire continue to burn until there isn't any more wood in it. If you'll read in the Old Testament, God said, are not my people fuel for the fire? 
the fire that is not going to be put out is the God of the universe who is a consuming fire. Setting aflame the carnal or wood or temporal part of us, purifying out of us any carnality and filling us with the supernatural life of his invisible being. If you'll read in Hebrews, it says that our God is a consuming fire. So, as we talked last week about the hieroglyphics, we've come to the realization that fire is not talking about fire out here, a natural fire, but in actuality, a supernatural fire which is on fire inside of us. Now, in the same way, in the natural world, you can view fire as a destructive, bad thing. If someone's house burns down, we consider that bad fire. If we see a field on fire, we want to put it out. But that same fire which destroys also keeps us warm in the wintertime, cooks our food, and does other things for us that are constructive and positive. In the same way, God's Spirit, though it destroys by fire the part of us that can be destroyed, it also gives us a new being that cannot be destroyed. Imagine our flesh as sand and God's Spirit as fire. When the two come together within us, it meshes and burns and creates a new substance, glass or crystal. The fire creates and makes us into a clear, transparent being who shows forth God in the earth. So, the fire of God is a constructive creating force and not destructive as we've been taught. If you'll remember, once the disciples of God asked Jesus to bring down fire from heaven and destroy them that had done him wrong. But he said to them, I didn't come to destroy men's lives but save them. They didn't realize that the fire of God was a constructive thing. That's why it says, if your enemy does you wrong, give him bread to eat. And if he does you evil, give him water to drink. For in doing so, you heap coals of fire on his head. That doesn't mean that you get revenge and destroy him. What it means is that you in the act of forgiveness set forth the purification process of God in him because forgiveness purifies your brother. When love and forgiveness are manifested in the world, the world is going to change involuntarily by God's power coming through us. I'd like if you would to open up to Philippians it's Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, and carry to full completion your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking for whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. The thing that discredits the name of Christ and does not honor God but offends God is the carnal mind which lives in every one of us, which God set up to be destroyed. Thorns were created to be burned, but the fruit of the vine 
was created to be enjoyed. In the same way, the thorns of our carnal nature are there to be burned up by the fire of God in order that he might cultivate and produce fruit with the Christ nature. Now he asked us there to work out our own salvation. The King James Version says with fear and trembling. It would lead people to believe that our salvation is in our hands to work out before God. But if you'll read the next verse, it tells us who's in charge of our salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. Our will is his power to create whatever he wants us to be. The only will we have is the will of what he wants us to be. Do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God and questioning and doubting among yourselves that you may show yourselves to be blameless and guileless innocent and uncontaminated children of God without blemish faultless unrebukable in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you are seen as bright lights beacons shining out clearly in a dark world now it's real easy to read that and think that he's talking about this world out here being dark but in actuality the lights that shine in the dark world are the lights within us that make each one of us Christ shining in the dark world of carnality which is flesh and blood. This is the world that he said would be deluged in the fire. This is the world that he said would be destroyed. Everyone will be salted with fire but the purification of God's love in us will create one new world that we might have peace in him. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This salvation is not of ourselves, for it is God at work creating in you the power of purification to purify you of all lust, greed, envy, hatred, and any other fault that might be within you. Purifying and creating a new life that will endure forever. Just as Lot, who represents the Christ in us, went into Sodom and Gomorrah, which represents chained or bound or fettered. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah mean. These being the carnal, temporal nature of man in us. God, when he saw the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, saved just Lot, but destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone from heaven. The heaven within us of God's Spirit destroying the Sodom and Gomorrah of our carnality and preserving just Lot, the Christ in us. So the fire of God's Spirit, which Paul said, don't quench the Spirit of God's fire. But that fire be in you and purify you into a new way of living. The fire of God which is sprinkled from heaven and gives us a new character and a new purpose, anointing us with the oil of joy and burning out the impurities that are within us. I'd like to close today 
by telling you a little parable. Imagine the world as a giant pan. And God took the pan and he put the popcorn in it. Each one of us representing a kernel of the corn. When we're kernels, that represents each one of us being in the carnal state. Kernel, carnal, they're real close. After we're in that state, he puts us in the bowl, which is the world, and he adds the oil. The oil representing his spirit. Then, guess what comes next? He puts us in the oil of his anointing and sets us over the fire. Now, the neat thing about God's spirit is it keeps the fire from destroying the kernels. He then turns the fire up and some time goes by. Soon after the fire's lit and burns and the oil begins to heat up, then he begins to shake the kernels and shake the world. Then the first kernel breaks forth into light. And after the first fruits, then the rest also change. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. When this mortal body has put on the immortal life body of Christ Jesus and put off the old man, then shall come to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. When these kernels become popcorn and he salts us with the purification then we shall be made a vessel that can be used by the master. Then we shall be the true sons of God, manifested in Jesus like a many-membered body, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people that he set apart for his very own. You see, we are the sheep of his pasture. What a wonderful God we have, Israel. Think about these things. Listen with your heart. Help others. Deny yourself so that others might have good. Hope in what you can't see. Do good to one another. Live and help others to love. And trust in God and in the fineness of everything he is. I'll see you next week, and until then, may the goodness and mercy of God's Spirit give you everlasting hope and eternal life, which God promised before the world began, which no man can deny, because nothing can be done against the truth of God. I'll see you next time. And remember, you have the mind of Christ now. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his boundless mercy, we have been born again into an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Born anew into an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change and decay, imperishable, unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who are being guarded by God's power through your faith till you fully inherit that final salvation that is ready to be revealed in you in the last time. You should be exceedingly glad on this account, though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations, so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested which is infinitely more precious than perishable gold, which is tested and purified by fire, 